through song. You stood before creation, eternity in your hands. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. Amen this morning and welcome to Lawrenceville First Methodist. We are so glad that you are joining us in worship today. My name is Ryan Shostak. I have the privilege of serving on the staff here at the church over our student ministry and we made it through the weekend. Yes, we did. Hi everyone. We oh, I, All right, how did so weak. Yeah, I know. Wait a minute. Hi everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> better, better. They're they're getting excited for football. Football season is starting. Are you guys excited? 
a little more excited. Cynthia, are you wow. excited for football? Are you ready for some football? Yes, I'm excited. This is hard. This is like, there's, there's no energy coming back. Come on, but guys. But guess what, Ryan? What? In 2025, the championship game will be played in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It will. I'm Woo excited. So we Are just got to wait and see who Alabama's going to be playing that day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a Georgia fan, a Georgia grad. We'll be there. Given You'll be there against Alabama. Yes, we'll okay, be there. Okay, okay. <laughs> So we're not just here to talk football, but we're here to make announcements. So good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia Jackson. I get to serve as one of the associate pastors here at LV First. And it's good to see all of you here. Whether you are joining us in person or online, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are here for the first time, we have a gift for you uh, out in the um, Welcome Center. So please pick that up after the service. And also, if you have any prayer requests, if your contact information has changed or if you are looking for ways to get connected, please fill out the connect card and put it in the blue bucket when we get ready to pass it. So coming up today, please be in prayer for our new members. Today is new members class. It's happening right now and also at 11 o'clock. Sarah Snyder is leading that. So we are just so thankful for those who are just seeking uh, to join with us here at LV First and also looking for ways to get connected. Also on August 28th, we will be giving out second grade Bibles. So if you have a second grader, please contact Catherine or Kim who are um, over the children's ministry so they can have uh, your child's name and make sure that they have a Bible on that day. Again, August 28th, we are handing out second grade Bibles. Please contact Catherine or Kim. And I'm excited about that. I have a second grader and Tucker gets his Bible and we got the email the other day that was like, you have a second grader, they get a Bible. And we're like, this is the wrong list. But our kids are growing up so fast, it's crazy, but we're excited, so come get your second grade Bible next week. A few other things going on in the life of our church. We've got a bed build coming up with Sleep in Heavenly Peace. This is an amazing ministry. If you've never been part of one of these bed builds before, I highly encourage you to sign up. It is really cool. It's an awesome thing that happens in the back parking lot of the church, and so we will be building beds for children here in Lawrenceville. They also need donations of twin comforters. They don't need the bed in a bag, they'll take them, but they really just need a bunch of comforters at this point, so please donate those. Also, something new we've got coming up starting September 11th is we've got a new Bible study starting for adults in their 20s and 30s. It doesn't matter if you're married, if you're single, if you've got kids, no matter what, no matter where you're at. If you're in your 20s or 30s, we want you to come join us for this new Bible study. This is an opportunity to build some new relationships, some new friendships, and we're actually gonna be diving into a book by Bob Goff called On um, undistracted, and so it's a really good book. We hope that you guys will come sign up and join us. If you have more questions about that, you can reach out to me, and there's my email on the screen. Uh, Casey and I will actually be the ones leading this class, and so hope you guys will come and join us. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight, there's amazing ministry that happens here at this church each and every week, and that is made possible by the ways that you guys continue to give and to support this church, not only financially, but also through your prayers and through your service. Our student ministry got rocking and rolling this last week, our children's ministry, we've had some amazing adult ministries, uh, we're feeding the Central Gwinnett football team before every game. It's been an amazing week around here at the church, and it is made possible by the ways that you continue to give and to support. And so in just a moment, we're going to pass the blue buckets from the inside to the outside. You can drop your Connect cards in there. You can also drop your offering. You can also give online, or you can give through the black box in the back. But let us offer a prayer for this morning's offering. Wonderful God, thank you. Thank you for this space and the opportunity we have to come and worship together. Lord, thank you for Lawrenceville First and for the ministry that happens in this community through this church. Lord, thank you for empowering us, encouraging us, and allowing us to go and put Lawrenceville first and to connect the church to the community and the community to the church. Be with the offering today. Allow it to go and continue to further your mission in this community. To your most holy name we pray, amen. Now check out some of the exciting stuff that has happened this week at LV First.
Awesome. Will you stand and join us for our call to worship today? Um, so we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, so we're going to do a, like a call and response kind of prayer thing. So we do these a lot in the traditional service, but I wanted to try it in here as well. So the words are going to be on the screen, and I will say something, and then when the bold font comes up, and it'll have like all in a colon, we'll all say that together. Um, but this is just a, a way for us to be able to participate, and uh, this specifically will be a prayer as we go into this time of worshiping God through song. Um, this, this will help us in a, in a different way besides a musical call to worship, this, this communal prayer to focus our hearts um, and minds on praising God while we're here. So when the bold words come up, we'll all say it together. So inexhaustible source of love and life, be with us in our time of worship as we seek the love it takes to walk in the ways of your son. Teach us to love. Nice, y'all got it? Help us to love our enemies and bless those who wrong us, for we cannot do so alone. Teach us to bless. Teach us the joy of treating others with all the same respect and goodness with which we hope to be treated. Teach us to respect. May our every word and deed make known that we are your beloved children and vessels of your love. Amen. Let's worship God.
song is based off of Galatians 6.14, the one we just sang. It says, may I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And it kind of goes into how every, everything that uh, is good, every victory that we have in our lives, uh, we, we can't boast of it of our own work, but it's all God's. Every victory is His. And, and connecting that to this song, so this, this song we're gonna sing is, uh, it's called Surrounded, in parentheses, Fight My Battles. It's the one that says, this is how I fight my battles a lot. Um, and if I've, I've never explained it before, the, the whole thing, uh, the way that we fight our battles is by worshiping, is by praising God, is giving it all to Him. In, in verse two, there's a line that says, so my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. And so connecting these, it, at one point it's, it's humbling, to know that uh, we can't fight these battles on our own. Uh, all the glory is God's, that we, we can't boast in anything of ourselves, but only in the cross. But in another way, it's comforting because I, I know at least me, I can't handle these battles on my own. That uh, sometimes it's, it's just overwhelming. But God is the one who does it all, who, who earns, who wins the victory. Psalm 23, four says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so I encourage you to be comforted that in, our, in the midst of our battles, that God is the one who wins the victory and he is walking with us every step. So all we have to do is just praise him and thank him. That's all we need to do. The victory, it, I mean, overall, the victory is already won. That Jesus won that victory with his death on the cross against every battle, against every sin, against everything in our lives that Jesus is already victorious. And so the way that we fight our battles is just to praise him and worship him. So I encourage you as we sing this song to fight your battles by praising God and thanking him for the victory that he's already won. Let's praise him together.
you to take some time to pray, to prepare for the message, to continue fighting whatever battles that you may face by praising God. gave your life to save ours. God, we thank you 
and we proudly boast in the cross where you won every victory, where you paid it all so that we could have life with you. God, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to surrender it all. And sometimes it feels like the battles we face are too much or that we can win them on our own. But today we acknowledge that we need you, that we cannot win the victories in our life without you. Every good and perfect gift is from you. So we give you glory and we give you praise for the victories in our life. And we give you our trust for the battles that we're in the midst of currently. We know that you have the victory. So we trust you. We trust your will, no matter what happens in our lives. We give it all to you. You are good and perfect. Thank you for the relationship that we get to have with you. We thank you for this time to be able to come and to worship you and to bless your heart. And God, as, as a response, we, we give this time to you. We give our worship to you. We give our lives to you. We ask it right now that you would open up our hearts and our minds and let us be ready to hear from you and to be changed by you for your glory and for our good. Have your way in us and lead us to deeper relationship with you, to better ways of sharing your love, to blessing those around us. Teach us and help us to receive your teaching and to, to follow what you say. We give you all the glory this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. My name is Adam Hildebrandt, and I get to be one of the pastors here at Lawrenceville First, and it's such a privilege to be worshiping with all of you this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or whether you're joining us online. We're just excited to be together and to have incredible times of worship like we just had. Uh, what, what opportunities to sing together, to praise together, to thank God for fighting our battles for us. What an incredible reminder for each and every one of us today. Uh, before we jump into the scripture, I just wanna remind you of, of one thing. I hope you've been following along with us in our 200th anniversary uh, devotion book. Uh, if you didn't get one, we've got some more of those available, or you can find that online. We're counting down 200 days until we turn 200. We figured that worked. You guys tracking with that? That makes sense, 200 days, 200 years. Uh, it'll, all, it, it'll lead up to a great celebration. But I hope you've enjoyed kind of reading some of the stories and hearing some of the ways that God has been at work over the last 200 years in our community and through this church. And, and I hope it's getting you a little bit excited about what God will do in the future through this amazing place, through this amazing church, through this amazing group of people gathered together in this special place. Um, a couple of things to think about. Uh, we do have uh, an anniversary fund set up. Uh, if you'd like to help out with some of the costs associated with the celebration, but also uh, placing the bell out in front of the sanctuary, uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that. And you can go online and, and there's a, 
uh, thing set up for that. You can give through, uh, through online and, and just put that in, in the memo line so that we know where that's going. But just such great opportunities as we move towards this moment of celebration to begin thinking and dreaming and hoping for what God will do in our midst through it. So, uh, last week, or two weeks ago, we kicked off this series called Meet the Teacher. Uh, lots of us have gone back to school in the last few weeks, uh, and we've had these Meet the Teacher moments. We, we've gotten to go and meet our teacher, and we've gotten to, to learn a little bit about their teaching style, what it is that they do, how they do it, uh, and now our kids come home every day, and they're like, oh, you know, you won't believe what we did, or you won't believe what we did. Right? There's the <laughs> you got those two ends of the spectrum. And, and, and our kids have had a great time. Our kids have, have been learning and, and, and growing and learning new things and figuring out how it is that they engage with the teachers that they have. We've met the teacher over the last few weeks, but as we come to find out what it is that Jesus teaches, it's amazing to think about. It's amazing to think about the invitation that Jesus has for each of, us, each of us, the way that Jesus teaches us, because the way that Jesus teaches is, is unique and special. It's challenging and difficult. In fact, over and over again throughout the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' longest teaching section, it's kind of like his magnum opus. This is what you need to do. If you're going to learn from Jesus, read this. This is the section of Scripture that kind of gives Jesus' biggest thoughts and ideas about how we should live and what we should do. And so many of them, so many of them upend what we would normally do. They take what our normal action would be, they take what, what we would normally know to do, and they, they, they flip them around. This summer, we had the chance to go uh, to Florida, and, and on the way back from Florida, I had told my kids a number of times about this great little tourist attraction. If you ever happen to be in central Florida in the middle of nowhere, in this great little town called Lake Wales, you should stop at a place called Spook Hill. All right, you've heard me talk about this before. Spook Hill is incredible. It's the only thing in Lake Wales, but it, it's incredible, right? So you, this little town in the middle of Florida, and, you, and you, you, you drive down past Spook Hill Elementary. I promise that's the name of the elementary school. Can you imagine meeting the teacher there? Uh, anyway, so you go to Spook Hill, you go past Spook Hill Elementary, you go to Spook Hill, you pull down to the bottom, there's this big sign that says Spook Hill, there's the story about the, the alligator and the, the Indian chief who got in a fight, and, and that's why he, this happens. So you go down to the bottom of the hill, there's this white line painted on the ground, you get to the bottom, you put the car in neutral, and I kid you not, the car rolls backwards up the hill. You guys aren't amazed? It's pretty amazing. It's so amazing that like my kids who are, are, are big thinkers, like they like to figure things out, they like to try to figure out exactly how this works. They, they were like, do it again. Do it again, let me videotape it because I wanna, I wanna study this. And so they're out there with their phone like videotaping, like, like trying to get the right angle and, and figure out why it is that the car seems to roll backwards up this hill. It, it kinda upends what you think about what should happen or the way we should respond. A lot of Jesus' teaching does that to each and every one of us. It, it takes the things that we think are the right way, the way that it should happen, the way that it should go, the way that we should respond, the way that we should behave, the way that we should react. And it turns it on its head. And for some of us, it's, it's very disconcerting to think about what it is that Jesus asks us to do the way that Jesus asks us to live, the teaching that Jesus gives to us. When, when we meet the teacher, when we encounter the teacher, when we come face to face with Jesus, when we hear what Jesus has to say to us, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes we're not sure if we really want to hear what he has to say to us. Over and over through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses this phrase. He says, you've heard it said, but I say. In other words, you've got these ideas about the way that the world should work. You've got these ideas about what it is that you should do, how it is that you should behave, uh, what it is that God has invited you to do, what God's requiring of you. The, you've heard it said, but, but I say. And he takes those things that we know so well, those things that we think we know so well, and he invites us to go deeper and further than we ever thought possible. Cynthia started us off last week looking at Matthew chapter 5, this, this very difficult passage that we don't really like. 
but invites us to live in such a unique way. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Luke records it in a slightly different way. Luke gives us a little bit more detail when he talks about this. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27, it says this, but, but I say to you, to those of you that listen, to those of you who hear, to those of you who want to put my, put my words into action, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Luke goes a little bit further with what he has to say, and, and on the surface, we read this and we go, I oh, don't know. Jesus, that doesn't, like, love your, love your neighbor. I can get behind that. But like the whole Good Samaritan story, we like that one. Who's your neighbor? Oh, everybody is. Everybody's my neighbor. I can love my neighbor. I can love my neighbor because I can go next door and, and I can borrow, a, you know, a cup of sugar or, or like they might, you know, help me out with my lawn, they might do this, they might do that. I can love my neighbor, I, 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 I can deal with that. But, but the idea of loving my enemy, no, 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 Jesus, that's my enemy. That's somebody I don't like. That's somebody I don't wanna be around. That's somebody I'm not gonna ask for help. That's somebody I don't even want to engage with. And Jesus escalates the reality of our love in inverse proportion to the way that we seem to escalate hate in our world. Because our enemies have become more numerous through the ages. It, it seems like we dislike more people than we disliked before. It seems like there's this gradual escalation as if uh, the culture around us has, has pulled us further and further apart. I don't like the people that don't think like I think, that don't do what I do. And, and as we get this further escalation in the number of people who we're against because they're not exactly what we want them to be. We continue to get this escalation in the way that we engage with one another, in the, in the, in the vile and the vitriol and the hate that we see. Now, you guys know I grew up in Florida, and in Florida we have these great little things called sand spurs. You ever experience these? You're like walking to the beach, and all of a sudden there's like intense pain in your foot because you've got a sand spur in, in your foot. Well, me and my brother, uh, if you keep them on your stalk, if you find them and you keep them on the stalk, me and my brother would have sand, war, sand spur fights, right? So you, you pull the stalk of sand spurs, it's like a, looks like a medieval mace on top of a green stick, and you just run up behind somebody and you go, bop! It will stick into their back, and sometimes you can even get blood, right? And so, you know, this starts off as a bit of a game. But you know how games go with siblings, right? You know, you, you, you kind of throw it soft the first time, and then next time you, you throw it a little harder. And then as you're getting them back, you, you, I mean, you, you're really trying to dig those sand spurs into their flesh. I mean, you want to draw blood. You're, you're getting bigger and bigger stalks. You're getting more and more sand spurs, and you're, you're hitting them with like a whole big clump of sand spurs. This is the way the world invites us to live. This is the way the world invites us to engage with others. If you wrong me, I wrong you back. And in fact, I'm probably going to wrong you more than you wronged me. I want to step it up. I want to take it a little bit further. I want to make sure that you know that you've done something wrong. And Jesus says, I'm not even inviting you to love just your enemy, or just your neighbors, just the people who you like. I'm inviting you to love the people who wrong you, who do something that you don't like, who don't agree with you, who vote differently than you, who think differently than you. I'm inviting you to love even them. You know, them, right? We all have a them. When we try to defend ourselves for the way that we act, the sentence always starts this way. But they, you know who they is now? We're all together. We can figure out who they is in our lives. But they, it might be, but they, my sibling, you know, in our house, but they happens all the time. It generally happens around three distinct 
issues. Like usually it's around uh, distribution of, of treats, right? But they got more. Or it's around distribution of, uh, of um, where we sit in the car. But they sat there last time. But they, you know, we get the but they's. Or, or around screen time, specific things that, that we, but they said this, but they did this, but they, and we, we try to justify our reactions to someone else by telling ourselves and everyone around us what they did. But they did this, but they did that, and Jesus upends all of our but they's. See, as soon as we start to butt they, as soon as we start to talk about who our enemy is, as soon as we start to define our enemy as anyone who's not for us and getting what we want, having our thing, as soon as we begin to butt they, we actually give away our, our ability to choose the outcome of the situation. We, we actually give our enemy more power than we have. We actually give them the ability to to have a foothold, to have more influence into our lives than they actually should. As soon as we but they, they are in control. And Jesus says there's a way of living that takes all of those but what they's, that there's this way of living that moves from, from just thinking about what they did and responding in kind, this, this way of escalation that seems to be the way of our world. He says, you've heard it said, you should love your neighbors, but I say, you should love your enemies. Because in doing so, you upend all of those but theys. And in fact, you should, you should go even further than that. You should, you should do good for people that you might not like. You should do good for people who hate you, who talk bad about you. You should, you should bless those who curse you. This is about words. This is about what we say, blessings and curses. Somebody who says bad things about you, you should say, that's understandable. It's understandable. Jesus says that we should say kind words about them even if they say terrible things about us. And he says that we should pray for those who abuse you. Now, uh, I want to just pause here because that word abuse has certain connotations in our culture. Jesus is not advocating for us to continue in abusive relationships. Uh, the real Greek word there talks about the way that we talk about people. It's an insult or something along those lines. But understand, if you're in an abusive situation, the, the prayer might be an action. The action needs to be to get the help that you need to get out of that abusive situation. What Jesus is really saying is that, that if we bless, if we do good, if we pray for those who we think, who we feel, who we might put in the category of enemy, It has the potential to change us. And even more so, it has the potential to change them. Pastor Ben Kramer says it this way. He says, Christianity should sound like my beliefs continue to deepen my love for others. But more often than not these days, it sounds like the depth of my love for others is contingent on how deeply they conform to the way that I think and believe. Dorothy Day, the Catholic writer, says this, that I really only love God as much as the person that I love the least. Jesus invites us to live in such a way that it takes away all of the but theys. Dr. Martin Luther King said it this way, talking about this very passage. He said there was a moment in history when the church had influence, when the church made a huge difference. But 
more often than not, we end up being a thermometer, just reflecting the cultural narrative, the cultural uh, milieu, the way that the, 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 the world around us invites us to behave, that we look like everybody else, that we behave like everybody else, that we're just a thermometer reflecting what's happening around us. But when the church is at its best, King goes on to say, it's the thermostat the world, it sets a temperature and says, this is how we're going to live, and the temperature is love. We're going to live in love, and we're going to be the ones that set the temperature. Not the the news channel, not our Twitter feed, not all of the people who say, if you don't do this, then that. We're going to set the temperature. The temperature is going to be defined by love. That's what Jesus invites us into, this radical way of living that takes away all the but they's and turns it into a but God. Because but God can do anything in any moment. But God can change a relationship. But God can bring people back together. But God can do things in people's lives and hearts that we think are too far from God, that they don't understand, that they don't get it, that they don't have it together, that they are the worst. Yet God can do something incredible and we think this is impossible we think that we we can't do this we can't do good and bless and pray for our enemies I don't know if you remember in 2006 there was a there was a shooting in an Amish school in Lancaster Pennsylvania gunmen walked in and killed 10 young people in this school. And the Amish community got together and they had a prayer meeting. At the end of that prayer meeting, they decided that that they would not just forgive. They wouldn't just forgive this gunman. But that they would take on as a responsibility the care of his family that he left behind. They paid for the funeral expenses. They showed up at the funeral for this widow and her young children. And they prayed with them, and they stayed with them. Because that's what love looks like. That's what love invites us to do. Maybe you prefer what what comedian Trevor Noah, what he says about this. He he wrote a great book, and he's told some incredible stories about growing up in apartheid South Africa, where people would hurl incredible insults at him because he was black. He said he was walking down the road one day with his mother, whose name was Patricia. He said somebody hurled an insult at us, something incredibly offensive in that culture. He looked at his mom and he said, Mom, what what do we do? How do we respond? And she said, Trevor, what we do is we take that insult and we stir it up with the love of Jesus and we send it right back to him. He said, time and time again, as I've experienced difficult things in my life, I've thought, that other person doesn't know who they're dealing with. They're dealing with the son of Patricia. He said, I constantly think, I'm just going to stir it up with the love of Jesus and send it right back. Uh, This kind of love is so radical that this kind of love changes the way that people live and engage, that this kind of love has the potential of reconciliation and building bridges and bringing people back together. It has the potential for the church to hold a unique place in a divided culture that says we're going to lead with love. No matter where you're at, no matter what you think, no matter what you think about us, we're going to lead with love that's what Jesus invites us to do. 
and you may say terrible things about us and you may uh, be really mean to us and you may talk bad about us on Twitter and Facebook and all the other things on the internet and you can do whatever you want to do, but we're going to lead with love. We're going to do good. And we're going to bless you. And we're going to pray for you. I mean, practically, this is, this is hard. You know how I know this is hard? Because I drive. <laughs> and I've seen some of you drive. <laughs> I am so happy to see all of those great LV First magnets everywhere, except when you cut me off. This is hard for us because, because even in traffic, we decide that it's me versus them. And if we would just zipper merge, everything would work just fine. But no, no, no. That person all of a sudden becomes my enemy. It's like an episode of Mad Max. I mean, like, what is going on? But all of a sudden, it's turned into, like, NASCAR racers. Like, Rubin's racing. They're not getting in front of me. That person's my, I'm going to get in front of, like... It's, it's crazy sometimes. And we all fall into this. Like, we, we, we get mad in the car. And so we have this practice in our car because we're trying to live into love and it doesn't work perfectly every time, but, but we're trying to really do this instead of uh, giving the uh, hand gesture or some other hand gesture. We give everybody a thumbs up. Because as mad as I am, if I give you a thumbs up when you cut me off, I'm going to start laughing. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how mad I am. If I just give you a thumbs up, you're, uh, it, all of our days are going to be better. We're going to do good. We're going to bless others. We're going to pray for those who persecute us. And if we do this, you know what I think we'll find? I think we'll find what theologian Henry Nouwen said. He said, when we love our enemies in the way that Jesus invites us to, we find we have less enemies. <laughs> when we love our enemies the way that Jesus invites us to, we find that we have less enemies. We don't walk around angry all the time. We're not always trying to prove our point no matter the cost. We're not always trying to get in front of that person. We're not always trying to get what we want. We're always leading with love. All of a sudden, we find that we have less enemies. We're less angry. We're less anxious. We're less upset. And the reason that we went to Luke chapter 6 instead of Matthew chapter 5 is because Luke closes this section with these words. You know, that love your enemies, do good, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. In verse 36, Luke says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. See, I think what we need to be reminded of is that we were loved even when we didn't have it all together. That, that God loved us even when we didn't do what we were asked to do. That God loved us when we lived our lives the way we wanted to instead of the way he invited us to. The Apostle Paul says it this way in his letter to the Romans. That God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, it's one step beyond do good, bless, pray. It's when we give our lives away for those who don't even know that they need it. But God proves in love, his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more surely than now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if, 
while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. God loved us in such a way, even when we didn't follow God. That he longed for our good, that he longed to bless us. Jesus prayed for each and every one of us. He gave himself for us. And it turns our but theys into but God. And it changes the way that we engage the world. If we love in the way of Jesus, if we follow this difficult teaching, if we do what Jesus has invited us to do, if we respond and we react in the way that Jesus invites us to do so, with love, it changes all of our but theys to but God's and give God, gives God the ability to move in ways that we never imagined before. Who are your butt they? Maybe today we might begin to pray for them. Lord, change them or change me, but something's got to change. Who are your butt they's? As we pray, as we sing our, our closing song together, I want to invite you to just begin to pray that God would change your heart, that you would begin to lead with love, because when you love in the way of Jesus, when you love your enemies, you find that you have a lot less enemies. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are so thankful for the way of Jesus, for the teaching that he gave us, for the way that he lived his life, for the way that he gave himself for us while we were yet sinners. While we didn't have it all together how we might have been but they. So God, as we accept the grace that you have given to us, the big, amazing love that you have for each and every one of us, God, we begin to pray for all of our but they's. All of those people who we feel have wronged us, who have done something to us, who we might put in enemies, who... who the, who think differently than us, who, who fall on a different side of the spectrum than us, who, who, who experience the world differently than us, for all of those people that we might classify as they or them, God, today we pray for them. We pray that they might know your love and your grace. And that as we experience that love and grace together, we might form bridges of love that bring us back together to share your good news more and more. God, if we haven't heard that you gave your very son for us, that today we might put our trust in that reality, that it might begin to change our lives. We might see the world differently because of Jesus, because we have met the teacher and we'll never be the same. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like, would you stand as we respond in that time of worship through song? When our homes are hid by heartbreak let your presence meet us there when the pain seems overwhelming we hold on to you when the streets are torn by chaos
hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. 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 May we go from this place leading with love, allowing God to take our but theys and turn them into but gods, where only God can do the work. It's not about us proving our point. It's about us loving well. May we go in that attitude of love. If you're uh, joining us for our new members class, I want to invite you to, to find us in the, in the Welcome Center out there. We'd love to help you find your way to that. We're excited to, to have you as a part of that today, and we'll see you all next week.